How many of you have ever heard some interesting, famous last words? Let me give you some famous last words I heard. One famous last word. I wonder where the mother bear is. No, really, I'm sure these are the good kind of mushrooms. Yeah. Famous last words. I'll hold it and you light the fuse. (laughs) Yeah. Famous last words. Look, Mom, no hands. (laughs) Famous last words. Are you sure the power's off? Famous last words. This was actually an inscription on a tombstone in Ashland, New Hampshire. I kid you not. The words were, I told you I was sick. (laughs) You got to have a twisted sense of humor to laugh at that one, but that's funny. (laughs) Rednecks, famous last words. Hey, y'all, watch this. (laughs) Right? We are in a message series called When Love Speaks. We've been talking about the seven words from the cross. Today we're going to be talking about the last part, the word of trust. And these are literally Jesus' final words before he dies on the cross. His last words. Read along as I read Luke chapter 23 that gives an account of this. By this time it was noon, and darkness fell across the whole land until three o'clock. The light from the sun was gone, and suddenly the thick veil hanging in the temple was torn apart. Then Jesus shouted, Father, I entrust my spirit into your hands. And with those words, He breathed his last. When the captain of the Roman soldiers handling the executions saw what had happened, he praised God and said, Surely this man was innocent. Now from these last words that Jesus spoke on the cross, there are some things that we can learn that we need to hold on to when our days are dark. This was the most difficult day Jesus ever faced. And he spoke these words, and we can learn from them that when we're going through a a dark time, a dark hour, a, a difficulty, when we're going through stress, difficult, rough times, we need to hold on to these same thoughts, these same ideas that Jesus gave us when he spoke his final words. So we're going to look at four of them. Number one. When I'm going through the darkest hour of my life, I need to remember that my heavenly Father loves me. My heavenly Father loves me. Jesus said in verse 46, Father, I entrust my spirit into your hands. Now, previously on the cross, Jesus said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Not Father, my Father, but God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because in that moment, he was separated from God as he literally paid for our sins. But that time of judgment is over. The penalty of sin was paid for. Reconciliation had been completed, and now Jesus calls out Father. It's a loving term. It means Daddy. Father. What do we know about God as a Father? A lot of times we impose on God as Father what our human father or mother was to us. And that's really not fair to God Because a lot of human parents are unreliable or inconsistent. They're petty and selfish. But God isn't like that at all as a heavenly father. He is close. He is a consistent father. He is a competent father. He is a caring father. He's full of compassion. Look what it says in Psalm 103 verse 13. 
As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who honor him. So Jesus starts with the Father to remind us that no matter what I go through, I have a Father in heaven who's compassionate, who loves me. When we go through tough times, we need to remember that no matter what it is we're struggling with, God's love for us doesn't change. Number two, when we go through difficult, tough times in life, We realize that my Father, our Heavenly Father, loves me and He can be trusted. He can be trusted. You can trust God with what you're going through right now. Look what the Bible says again in verse 46. Jesus said, Father, I entrust my spirit into your hands. Now, folks, one of the great questions of life you eventually have to answer at some point in time is, who are you going to trust? And the way you answer that will determine whether you're happy or miserable, whether you succeed or fail, whether you make something of your life or you waste your life. It depends on who you're going to trust. How many of you think it's probably a really good time in America to trust our politicians? Anybody interested in that? I don't think so. Just not going to happen. Well, how many of you would say, well, you know what? I trust the media because they're always honest. Hmm. How many of you would say this? I'm going to trust myself. I'm going to trust my own thoughts, my own feelings. I'm going to trust that gut instinct I have. It's probably not too good either. If you're really honest with you, you probably don't want to trust you all the time. You can't trust your emotions. They can be manipulated. They change. If you're going to entrust your life and your future to someone You better choose someone who has your best interest at heart, who knows everything, who is perfect, who will never lie to you, and that kind of limits your options to um, God, right? Psalm 33, verse 4, for the word of the Lord holds true, and everything he does is worthy of our trust. Folks, I want to suggest that you finally realize once and for all you have a Father in heaven that you can trust. This word that Jesus uses here, he entrusts himself to God, it means to commit, it means to yield, to deposit something for the safekeeping of another person. Now, probably most of us know what a safety deposit box is. It's some place where you deposit, where you place, where you put something that's important to you, that's worth a lot of money. And you don't want anybody to steal it. You don't want it to rust. You don't want it to burn up. And so you go to the bank, you put it in the safety deposit box, and you entrust the the care of that to the bank. Jesus is saying here, I'm entrusting myself to my Father. I'm making a deposit of my life, my soul, my spirit to him for safekeeping. So here's a question. What do you need to entrust God to today? What you need to entrust God to today is whatever you're worrying about. Whatever's getting your attention in a negative way, whatever you're worrying about, whatever you're fretting about, you need to entrust that into the hands of God. And while we're talking about this, entrusting your soul to God, entrusting yourself to God, entrusting your spirit to God, entrusting your life to God, let me answer a couple of tough questions that come up from time to time. One of the questions I've I've heard over the years is, as a pastor, is what about babies? 
What about babies who die? Do they go to heaven? What about people who don't have the mental capacity to understand what it means to accept Christ as their Savior? Maybe they're special needs children or special needs adults, and they're not fully aware of right or wrong or the ability to accept and commit intellectually to Jesus Christ. What happens to them? The answer is simple. They go to heaven. That's why the Bible says in Psalm 116, verse 6, the Lord protects the simple-hearted. He's talking here about people who don't have the ability to know right from wrong to make moral decisions, whether they're a child or an adult. The Bible says God protects them. He takes care of them. When the time comes, he receives them into heaven. When King David in the Old Testament had a son, an infant baby, died just a few days after it was born, and David said this in 2 Samuel chapter 12, He said, can I bring him back again? Can I bring him back to life? He said, no, but I will go to him. I can't bring him back, but one day I'll see him again in heaven. What about people who have been true believers in Jesus, but somehow over their lifetime they got confused and they stopped believing? You may know people like that, friends, family members. Maybe they join some cult. Maybe they just get all mixed up and they're not sure what they believe anymore. What happens to those people who were believers but then change their mind later? Folks, if they were true believers, they go to heaven. You don't lose your salvation because you get confused. The Bible says we get into heaven by God's grace. It is a gift. Look what Paul said in 2 Timothy 1.12. For I know the one in whom I trust, and I am sure that he is able to safely guard all that I have given him until the day of his return. You give your heart, you give your life, you give all of who you are to God, and things happen in your life or in a friend's life, in a family member's life, and they start walking away and it just doesn't look like they're doing right. They don't lose their salvation. Folks, that's good news. Because all of us could walk away at any given time, depending upon how life treats us and how we respond. I thank God that our salvation isn't dependent upon us. Aren't you? Ephesians 2, 8, 9, Paul put it this way. For it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. It is not the result of your own efforts, but God's gifts, so that no one can boast about it. We are saved by God's grace through faith, not by self-effort. It is a gift Of God. So those believers who get lost along the way. They're going to be the same place we are. Here's another question. That I hear. This is tough. Difficult. What about true believers. Who take their own life. What about believers. Who commit suicide. I don't know where this idea was. You know, God, the blood of Christ can forgive us of all of our sins, but not suicide. Like the blood of Christ is strong enough to forgive us of everything else, but not if a Christian takes his own life. Where'd that come from? (laughs) Maybe. Many of the greatest saints in the Bible actually struggled with deep, despair, deep depression, deep overwhelming senses of failure in their lives and suicidal thoughts. Some people in the Bible at different low points in their life said things like, I wish I'd never been born. David said that in in Psalm 13. Jeremiah said it in Jeremiah 20. Job said it in Job chapter 7. I wish I'd never been born. I would just rather die than be here any longer. 
What do these people have in common? Elijah, Moses, and Jonah. The answer is all three of these great saints, at one point they were so depressed that they asked God to kill them. Get it over with right now. As a pastor, I've seen, unfortunately, a number of people take their own life. Breaks my heart. Can imagine what it does to the family. Maybe some of you have family or close friends who have attempted suicide or maybe even committed suicide. My heart hurts with you. But a person doesn't lose their salvation because they commit that sin versus any other sin. You know how they get to heaven? Same way you get there, same way I get there. By the grace of God through Jesus Christ. When he gives us the gift of eternal life. Folks, if you're ever feeling like that, if you're ever struggling with that, would you please tell somebody? Would you please give me a call? Let me know. Let one of the other pastors know. It doesn't seem like it at the time. But you can get through it. One of my favorite promises in the Bible is in 2 Timothy 2.13. If we are faithless, anybody ever been faithless to God? If we are faithless, He will remain faithful for He cannot disown Himself. That's good news, folks, because what it says is even if we get to the point in our lives where we sometimes get so messed up and we're in so much pain that we don't even believe God right now, we don't believe he exists, and we're ready just to check out, God says, even if you're unfaithful, I'm faithful because I can't disown myself. And you've deposited yourself into God's safety deposit box. You have a father who loves you and he can be trusted to keep you and to keep everything that you've given to him. I don't know what you may be going through. I don't know what a friend or family member of yours may be going through. But I'll tell you, you have a father in heaven who loves you. And you have a father in heaven who is worthy of of your trust. Let me share with you a third thing that we need to do, that we learn, that Jesus did on the cross, that we can do when we're going through hard times. Number three, we need to realize that my Father is doing things that I cannot see. He's doing things that we can't see. There is an unseen spiritual realm where God lives and exists and he's working behind the scenes in your life and you don't always see it. Luke 23, 46, Jesus said, Father, I entrust my spirit into your hands. And this implies, obviously, that you're far more than a body. You're a spirit. He said, I entrust my spirit into your hands. You're not just a body. There's a spirit in you. And when you die, your body is going to be buried in the ground, but your spirit lives for all eternity because we were made in the image of God. So we have a soul, we have a spirit, and death, physical death, is not the end. One day your heart is going to stop, but your spirit's going to go on for eternity to live with God for the rest of eternity or to live separated from him, depending upon the choice that you make. And God is working in your life behind the scenes even when you can't see it or feel it. 
There is a cosmic battle between good and evil going on all the time because this life is not all there is. But you can't always see what's happening. Look what the Bible says in Job chapter 23, verses 9 and 10. It says, when he is at work in the north, I do not see him. When he turns to the south, I catch no glimpse of him. But he knows the way that I take. And when he has tested me, I will come forth as gold. That problem you're going through right now, that struggle, the Bible says it's a test. God wants to purify you as gold. You may not see how he's working up north. You have no clue how he's working down south. You can't even see him east to west. But he's working. He's working in you. He's making you who he wants you to be. About that, Paul said this in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. God's working behind the scenes and we can't see it. And when you're going through your darkest hour, you need to remember that you have a heavenly father in in heaven who loves you. He can be trusted and he's working behind the scenes for you. You Say, well, gosh, Kevin, if he's working behind the scenes for me all the time, I'm not real impressed because I'm struggling Well, sometimes you've got to struggle in life. He's not working in you to make you and your, your, your life comfortable all the time and just enjoying it and having fun all the time. Mm, sorry, if I've ever led you to believe that, uh, that's just wrong. You remember, I know I've said it. He is making us, you and me, He's making us more and more into the image of his son. You got anything in your life that doesn't reflect Jesus really well? Hmm? I mean, are there a few things you could say, oh, my mind or my thinking or my thoughts or my behavior, I'm selfish, that you got things in your life that really aren't Jesus-like? He's got some work to do in you. And it's not always fun. It's not always easy. You won't always see it. But you trust Him. Number four. Something else we learn from Jesus, what He did on the cross, that we need to be doing where we're, when we're going through difficult times. We need to remember that my Father can handle anything that I give him. He can handle anything. He can handle your doubt, your complaints, your pain. He can handle it. Jesus said, Father, I entrust my spirit into your hands. I love that phrase, into your hands. It's a beautiful expression of care and security and trust and ability. I'm entrusting myself, God, into your hands. 2,000 plus years later, they still use this phrase in commercials. You're in what? Good hands with Allstate. That's right. What does that mean? It means you can trust them. In your crisis, you can trust them. You're in good hands. They'll take care of you. Folks, God has really big hands. He's got the whole world in his hands. Somebody should write a song using those words. You want God's hands on your life? 
in your life, over your life, under your life. You want to be in his hands. Let me me tell you why. Let me give you three things about God's hands, the Bible says. First of all, the Bible says God's hands are big enough to bless me. Jesus often touched people in order to bless them. He gave them the touch of blessing. He would lay his hands on them and, and bless them. And God's hands are big enough to bless me. Psalm 139.5, you both precede and follow me. You place your hand of blessing on my head. Can you imagine God placing his hand of blessing on you? I played um, sports growing up. I played basketball. I played recreational basketball when I was just a child. And at the end... They had an awards banquet at the end of the season that you'd go to, and they would always have somebody come in and speak. And this year, Wes Unseld came to speak at our sports banquet. Now, I don't know if you know who Wes Unseld is. He's a professional basketball player for the Baltimore Bullets back in the day when they had the Bullets in Baltimore. He wasn't a tall center. He was only six feet, seven inches tall, but one of the best centers that ever played the game. Incredible. Look at his hands. Each hand covers just about an entire half of a basketball. And I was this tall when I walked up to him and he had his trophy in one hand and he put out his hand like this and I put out my hand to shake it and his hand literally engulfed my hand, my fingers all the way up to here. Gone. That man's got the biggest hands I've ever seen because his big hand just... Now think, you multiply that times God. God says... You trust me. I've got you in my hands. God's hands are big enough to bless me and they are scarred to never forget me. The nail prints that are in Jesus' hands are permanent. Did you realize in heaven the only scars, the only wounds in heaven will be on Jesus? The nail prints in his hands, the scar in his side, from the crown of thorns in his feet. Why? To remind us how much he loved us. Isaiah 49 says this, Can a mother forget the baby at her breast and have no compassion on the child she has born? Though she may forget, I will not forget. I have engraved you on the palms of my hands. If you want to know how much you matter to Jesus, just look at his hands. That's how much he loves you. He's never going to forget you. God's hands are big enough to bless me. They are scarred, so they, they, they will never forget me. And God's hands are strong enough to keep me eternally secure. Strong enough to keep us eternally secure. John chapter 10 says this, I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of the Father's hands. Once you put your life in God's hands, no one can snatch you out. It it just can't happen. It's impossible. God's hands take care of you. When my boys were little, like many of your boys and girls, we were in a pool in the when they were just little, little, they'd come up to the edge of the pool and I'd be in the water and I'd say, jump, jump. And they wanted to, but they didn't because they were scared. And I'd say, no, daddy's going to catch you. Daddy's going to catch you. You jump. I'll take care of you. 
I'll, I'll catch you with my hands. I'll take care of you. And they wanted to, but they didn't. And finally, one would get brave enough just to go, all right. And they would jump out. And sure enough, I called them right there with my hands. And then you know what happened next, right? A hundred more times. I'm like, please, no more, no more. Your father has you in his hands. He's going to be there for you. He's going to catch you. He's going to take care of you. Your father may be waiting for you to jump this morning. What is it he's wanting you to be involved in? What is it in your life he's wanting you to strengthen? What is it is he telling you that you really don't need to be a part of that anymore? In what ways do you need to trust God? What ways do you need to entrust yourself to him just like Jesus did? Would you pray with me, please? Father, thank you for uh, letting us look at the words that Jesus, that you spoke when you were there hanging, suffering, going through terrible torture on the cross. Thank you for speaking last, your last seven words, your last phrases. And thank you, Lord, that right before you died, you spoke a word of trust. Father, sometimes our trust gets mixed up. We put it in things that we have no business putting it into. Sometimes we fail to trust you and we take things on ourselves to do that we have no business doing on our own. Sometimes we selfishly don't go the way you want us to and we break our trust with you. Thank you, Lord, for giving us a call this morning to renew our trust in you. So, Lord, I, I realize your word is used by you, Holy Spirit. You take your word, your message, and you speak to everybody here. That's just how you work. What I want to pray now, Spirit, is that you'll guide us to respond to what we've heard so we can be the people who you want us to be. Bless our time of response this morning, Lord. We give it to you. In Jesus' name, amen.